I think we're I think we're good to go. Uh, I just before I introduce our reader for today, I just wanted to let you know kind of the I, itinerary of what what's going to happen. So Sean's going to come up in a, a minute and he's going to read for a little bit. Then afterwards, he'll take um, some questions and answers. Uh, there are books for sale outside, and he'll be sitting right here after the Q and A to do uh, a book signing for you, and or just you can come up and say hi to him. Um, I'm sure you'll have no problem doing that. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Okay. So my name is Laura Kopchik. I'm the coordinator for the creative writing program in the English department here at UT Arlington. And I'm here to introduce you to today's reader, the fiction writer, Sean Hamill, whose fantastic new novel, A Cosmology of Monsters, was released just last month from Pantheon Books and has already garner garnered high praise from both critics and readers. One fan of the book, in fact, is a writer you may have heard of, and that's Stephen King who had this to say about a cosmology of monsters. If John Irving ever wrote a horror novel, it would be something like this. I loved it. But before Sean comes up here to read, I'd just like to say that we've had a lot of fantastic writers over the... I'm sorry, I can't ever get through an introduction to Sean without getting emotional. Okay. <laughs> we've had a lot of fantastic writers over the years who have come to UTA to read, but I've never been as excited as I am today to welcome Sean. Sean is a graduate of UTA and was a creative writing minor and an English major. Some of my fondest memories as a teacher are of reading and workshopping the stories he wrote in advanced fiction, one of which ended up winning the first creative writing contest we held here at UTA. Even after graduating, he went on to serve for several years as a reader for the Catherine Ann Porter Book Award that I was serving as a general editor for, which meant spending several hours every Saturday during most of the summer over there in the dank conference room in Carlisle Hall, wading through literally hundreds of manuscripts to narrow our search down to five finalists. During this time, I continue to have the good fortune to read more of his stories and to celebrate in his success. Success is. <laughs> when one of his stories won second place in the Raymond Carver Award competition from Carve Magazine, it was pretty clear that his future was going to shine in the literary world, and it has. He went on to receive his MFA in fiction from the Iowa Writers' Workshop which for those of you who are unfamiliar with the program, you should know that it's the most prestigious writing program in the world and damn near impossible to get into. <laughs> Recently, a colleague asked me if Sean is the most talented writer I've ever taught here at UTA, and the question gave me pause because, of course, there have been several talented writers that I've been privileged enough to teach. In fact, several of the writers are in this room right now. But I said to her soon after she asked her question, if Sean was the writer with the most talent, and also the hardest working, the answer is an absolute yes. Please welcome my former student and my dear friend, Sean Hamill. Hello, UTA. <laughs> I cannot express how excited. I, this is, of all the, I've, got, I've been very fortunate with this book to get to do some touring over the last month, but this is kind of the event I've had in my back pocket is the thing like, I don't have to meet a bunch of strangers. I mean, most of you are strangers, but at least you know my family's here. Uh, a lot of my old professors are here, so this is this is kind of like a homecoming for me. So thank you guys so much for coming out on a very dreary Wednesday uh, to, to to do this. Uh, you know, and hopefully some of you are picking up some extra credit uh, for being here. So, uh, so like Laura said, I figured I'd start out just reading a little bit from the book. And then uh, we can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about, you know, uh, hopefully about the book. But if you want to talk Star Wars, we can do that. <laughs> Just whatever. Um, <clears throat> so the excerpt I'm going to read is about 100 pages into the book. Uh, it's in the third section. So to kind of set up the excerpt for anybody who hasn't read the book yet. Um, so our narrator, Noah Turner, is about six years old. It's 1989. Uh, his mother, Margaret, and his older sisters... Sydney and Eunice built this really great haunted house uh, in 1982, back before Noah was born. They had a really bad time with it. It was very successful, but it was also the moment when the family kind of started falling apart. So, um, you know, they would prefer to leave it behind, but they're in dire financial uh, straits right now. And Sydney's drama teacher, Mr. Ransom, has offered them a partnership to build a for profit haunted house. And um, so they don't really have much of a choice, they feel. Meanwhile, while all of this is going on, Noah has been hearing this weird scratching noise at his bedroom window every night, and a couple of nights ago, 
someone or something left a Batman action figure on the atrium ground right outside his bedroom window. Uh, and it's this toy that he'd been sort of lusting after but couldn't afford and his mother wouldn't buy it for him. So um, we kind of pick up with the Turners and Mr. Ransom and um, uh, uh, Margaret Turner's business partner, Sally, uh, as they're sort of getting ready. They're, they're pulling all the pieces of the old haunted house from 1982 out of storage. So, uh, sorry, let me get a little water. Okay. <clears throat> Mom and Sydney set up shop at an old warehouse on the far side of town. Mom sold a rare run of The Amazing Spider-Man to pay for the lease, and the weekend after signing, my family made a trip in Sally's car to our old uh, storage unit. Mr. Ransom and a couple of the theater kids met us there, and together we unpacked all the props, costumes, and sets from the tomb. I watched with simultaneous wonder and disappointment as it shambled piece by piece back into the light. Wonder at finally seeing this obscure bit of family history and disappointment at how cheesy it all looked under the unforgiving fluorescence. Flimsy sheets of wood painted to look like limestone brick in a mummy's tomb. Flaking paper mache monster masks. Intentionally raggedy costumes with stitching that might drive a Lovecraftian hero into hysterics. I directed vast nightmare chambers in my imagination and the actuality was, like my family's former house, a letdown. Mom, Sydney, and Eunice, on the other hand, looked uneasy and troubled. Once everything was loaded and strapped down, the whole unit fit into two pickup truck beds. We drove out to the new warehouse, which sat on the town limits at the end of a long, narrow, tree-lined drive. Sydney got out of the car to unlock the gate, and we pulled into a massive parking lot before a rectangular box of a building, dull and gray as cinder block. Mom led us through the glass front door and into a reception area with a large desk and a few dusty chairs pushed against the wall, then through a set of double doors into the warehouse proper, a big open space with a concrete floor and exposed rafters, a pair of restrooms in one corner, and along the wall facing the parking lot, a series of rolling garage doors. Dust billowed under our feet and the hot, stuffy air stung my nose. They opened two of the dock doors and moved everything inside, spreading it across the empty floor. While the theater kids drank soda in the parking lot, Mom, Eunice, Sydney, and Mr. Ransom surveyed everything, assessing what could be reused and what ought to be thrown away. They realized quickly that Mom's initial idea, reconstruct the tomb, freshen the paint, and add a couple of chambers, wouldn't work. For one thing, much of the wood Dad had salvaged during construction had either rotted or cracked, rendering it unusable. For another, it all looked small and cheap arrayed in such a large, well-lit space. If we ask people to drive out here for this, Mr. Ransom said, gestur gesturing at the flattened set, they're going to feel ripped off. This won't do at all, Mom said. So we have a few weeks to dream up something from scratch, he said. He ran both hands through his hair. Not necessarily, Sidney said. She unzipped Eunice's ever-present backpack and removed a small portfolio from which she pulled a stack of paper. She passed sheets around to everyone. The page I received featured a picture of a group of teenagers huddled together in a bedroom, shining a flashlight under the bed while something peered at them from its hiding place in the closet. As we traded drawings, I realized that each featured the same group of teenagers in a different scene. In one, the kids moved through a morgue, while behind them a body sat up in an open drawer, still draped in a sheet. In another, the kids walked across a small pond, stepping from stone to stone, while a scaled, webbed hand reached out of the water toward one poor girl's ankle. And yet another, a rich man's study lined with animal heads, this same girl had been snatched by the monster, and it dragged her away while the rest of the kids hugged one another in terror. In each picture, the kids shared a single flashlight. You did these? Mom asked. Sydney nodded. I had no idea you could draw, she said. How come there's always one flashlight? I said. That's the concept, Sydney said, looking relieved at the change of subject. We take some of the simplest, most mundane scare rooms, the easy ones we can throw up in a few weeks, and we add a chase element. So in addition to the regular scares, there's a monster tracking you, and you're trying to escape before it finds you. We only let people through in groups of four, and the only lighting in the place is a single flashlight. Maybe we even plant one of our own people in a group every now and then, and the monster could get that person. It would be cheap, and we wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel in a few weeks. Everyone else handed Sydney's drawings back to her, but Mom held on to hers. Her face looked tight, as though the flesh had been yanked taut. 
How did you come up with this, she said. Sidney fussed with the stack of pages. Mr. Ransom always says that necessity is the mother of invention, right? I just tried to think up what would be easy. She held out her hand for the picture. These drawings are good, Mom said. More than good. She sounded miserable about it and handed the drawing back to Sidney with obvious reluctance. Is this really what you want? A moment of silence followed, broken only by Mr. Ransom's snort. Jesus, Sidney, he said. I'd hate to be you when I go to sleep at night. He looked around at us, half a smile on his face, but it faded when none of us laughed. Speaking of, should Noah be here for this conversation, Eunice said. What, I said, what did I do? Nothing, Eunice said, but I, w I don't want you having nightmares. Mom pointed over our shoulders. Eunice, take your brother to the office while we talk. I want to help, I said. Go play with Eunice, Mom said. I'll take him up front, but I'm coming back, Eunice said. I'm part of this. Mom considered. Fine, she said. But don't touch anything, she called as Eunice tugged me away. Later that night, as Eunice tucked me in, I complained about how unfair this all was. Life isn't fair, buddy, she said. Mom would have let me help if you hadn't said anything. Mom isn't paying proper attention, Eunice said. But I am, and you have to trust me when I say this will be too scary for you. She leaned over and kissed me on the forehead. Who do I love most? It was too early for that question. Wait, aren't you going to read to me? I'm sorry, but I have to get started on the script tonight. Mr. Ransom's making me work with this girl from his playwriting class, so I have to come up with some ideas before I meet with her tomorrow. Maybe I'll have time in a couple of days? She hurried across the room and flipped off the light switch. Good night, little prince. I lay fuming in the dark. Why did my family always exclude me? Why wasn't I ever a part of things? When the scratching at the window started, instead of fear, I felt a hard ball of anger in my stomach. I climbed out of bed and yanked aside one of the curtains. The anger dissipated at once, replaced by wonder. My first impression was of dark stone blocking my view of the atrium, tall and monolithic, but roiling dark on dark like flirting clouds of smoke. I leaned forward, trying to gauge the object's size, and it moved, its top sweeping down. A face drew level with mine, elongated and furry, its snout pressed to the glass and exhaling blasts of fog. Its eyes were bright orange. I started to flinch back, but then realized I was only doing it because I was supposed to. It's what people on TV and in movies did when they saw a monster. I wasn't actually afraid. I wanted to see this thing. The creature kept still as though understanding and obeying my desire. I let my gaze linger on its tufts of brown fur, orange eyes and protruding snout, its talons on the glass, its garment like a living shadow, shrinking and bending from the light, sometimes black, sometimes red. I put a hand to the cool glass and spread my fingers. The creature tilted its head to one side, then mimicked my movement, placing its long taloned paw opposite mine. It looked at our hands, then back at me. I couldn't shake the impression of a dog and laughed a little. The creature exhaled hard, fogging the glass. Startled, I stepped back. A dog, maybe, but dogs could still bite. I shifted to look through unfogged glass. The creature had also drawn back into its cloak, so only its snout remained visible. It peeked at me from inside, an orange gleam in its eye sockets. I leaned forward and held up one finger. Wait a minute, I said. Do you understand? The creature held up one digit, then nodded slowly as though trying out the gesture for the first time. I moved my finger to my lips to signal for quiet. Again, it mirrored me. I let the curtain drop and crossed the room to my toy box. I opened the front panel as quietly as I could and thrust my arm through all the sharp plastic edges to the very bottom where I'd hidden the Batman action figure. Next, I grabbed my Kermit the Frog flashlight off my nightstand. I unlatched and opened the window wide enough for me to wriggle through. I stood on the concrete of the atrium, barefoot. The creature kept its distance. Extended to its full height, it looked at least seven feet tall, most of its considerable length obscured by the amorphous cloak. I turned on the flashlight to get a better look, but the creature held up its claws and looked away. You don't like that, I said. It shook its head no. I'm sorry, I said, and switched it off. The creature faced me again, its breath heavy and wet. I grew uncomfortable beneath the bright, unwavering gaze. I wasn't used to being so visible or noticed. 
I held up the Batman toy. Did you bring this? I said. It nodded. Why? I said. The creature crouched and picked up a chunk of sidewalk chalk. It made several slow, unsteady scratches on the ground. I shone my light on the space and read a single word written in jagged, barely legible letters. Friend. Friend, I said. You want to be friends? The creature nodded. Why? I said. It remained crouched before me, but made no response. I held up Batman again. You didn't steal this, did you? The creature shook its head no. Behind the creature, the living room light came on. Had someone heard us? The creature cringed without turning around, as though even this veiled illumination hurt. I have to go now, I whispered. Bye. I turned to my open window and crouched to crawl back inside. One of the creature's claws landed on my shoulder. I had the sensation of drifting the way you do in the moments before sleep, everything around me soft and comfortable like a blanket. I bumped my head against the window and found myself back in the atrium, squatting outside my window with a monster's paw on my shoulder. I shrugged it off, embarrassed, as though I'd been caught naked. What do you want? I said. The creature scratched out another message with sidewalk chalk, and I shone my light on the ground to read it. Inside? If it had made the request before it touched me, I probably would have acquiesced. But now, waking from that sweet fog, I declined. I might get in trouble, I said. And then, after a second's internal debate, I added, you can come back tomorrow if you want. It didn't try to stop me as I wriggled back into my room, but stared as the glass slid closed between us. Good night, I whispered, putting my hand to the window. The creature, my monster, my friend, put its paw opposite mine and scratched the glass, whining just a little. With their concept decided upon, my family in the Vandergriff High Theater Department began to work in earnest. I wasn't allowed back in the warehouse, so I saw none of it. Instead, I spent my afternoons and evenings in the back room of my mom's comic book store, doing homework and entertaining myself. Aunt Sally picked me up from school and brought me back home at night. She checked my homework, put me to bed, and stayed until Mom, Sydney, and Eunice returned. I saw my family only in the mornings, sleepily shuffling past one another as they prepared for the day. I missed Eunice, but my friend visited every night, arriving sometime between Sally's kind but rote goodnight and the strange floating place between wakefulness and sleep, its scratch at the window as gentle as a shake on the shoulder. If I'd been older, or a little more careful, or if adults had paid more attention to me when I was small, I might have worried about getting caught out there. But I was used to being invisible, and anyway, it was tough to worry about anything once my friend arrived. At first, we played with action figures, but the creature's strong, clumsy hands popped off heads and arms. Next, we tried board games, but the creature seemed to have trouble remembering the rules, and winning every time grew tiresome, so we started working through my collection of books. First, I read to it, and then we copied out sentences and pictures. The creature's penmanship remained atrocious, but when we tried to copy illustrations from Danny and the Dinosaur, its facsimiles actually resembled the contents of the book. You're good at this, I said, frustrated as I compared our work on the pavement to the book. My own pictures were crude and incomprehensible blobs of color. I wish I could draw like you. The creature offered me a fat blue cylinder of chalk, which I took. It stepped behind me, put one paw on my right shoulder and the other around my left wrist, and began to guide my hand on the ground. Again, I was flooded with that incredible sense of drifting bliss, of warmth and comfort and desire fulfilled. I was vaguely aware of the concrete in front of me, the same way you're aware of the road through a streaked and filthy windshield. When the creature let go, the feeling receded, and I rounded on it, frustrated and disoriented, chalk raised in one hand as though ready to strike. My friend looked a bit woozy, too, its head bobbing from side to side. It gave me a questioning look. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't mean to. The creature pointed over my shoulder. I picked up my flashlight and shone it where I'd made my guided drawing, a vast, sprawling city in miniature, as if seen from a hilltop, stretching out in concentric circles of towering skyscrapers, and, at the center, the nucleus of this strange cell, a tower reaching into the heavens. It looked familiar, someplace I'd been before. I did this, I said. The creature pointed at me, then, it, then at itself, then interlaced the digits of its paws. We'd done it together. It bent forward and scratched its nightly question on the pavement. Inside, I gave my nightly reply, not tonight. 
I didn't tell anyone about the creature, although I wasn't entirely sure why at the time. Call it instinct. Looking back now, I wasn't worried about seeming crazy, but I was happy to have something entirely my own, something my family couldn't hide or take away from me. Thank you. Yeah. So something I've heard of writers trying before and trying to keep the, the description of a monster kind of like yours more secretive is not really knowing themselves, but rather making it up as they go. So my, my question is, do you know what that monster looks like, or did you intentionally try and kind of keep it vague to yourself? Um, I. It was something that sort of evolved as I wrote the book. When I started writing it, uh, it I, I wasn't really sure, but what happened was the monster actually became a much bigger character in the book as the story goes on. So I couldn't really uh, keep it off stage the way some writers do. It, 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 so you get, um, I'm trying to pick my words carefully here. You get very acquainted with the physiology of the monster. So it, it, there, there's no secret about its appearances by the time you're done. So, um, but, but I, I think in a large part that's just because, you know, like in the movie, like uh, The Shape of Water, you know, you need to know what the fish man looks like because he's the romantic lead of the, you know, the movie. So you can't really hide him. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The uh, blue and orange on the uh, book covers at the UTA. <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, I didn't think about it, but subconsciously I must have because um, that was the first cover design that they showed me, but the orange stuff on it was green. And since the monster has orange eyes, I asked if I could see it in orange, and that's what we went with. And not only are those the UTA colors, but those are also my high school colors. <laughs> so I. <laughs> I was really just hammering home the, I, I guess, autobiographical aspects of the book. <laughs> Thank you. Um, here, we'll start here and then move across. Yeah. Uh, Sean, did it start as a short story, or did you know pretty early on that you were writing a novel? Um, well, this, this novel actually came together from a couple of projects that crashed and burned. Uh, the first one was a short story that... Um, was about a married couple breaking up while they're touring a haunted house. And the other was a, a novel about a family running a business together, but the original business was supposed to be a youth hostel in New Mexico. So um, at a certain point, neither project was really working, and I was just walking my dog, and they kind of <coughs> collided. And I was like, oh, OK. And I knew how to fix them both by kind of turning them into one, one big thing. So uh, yes? I just wanted to ask you a little bit about place. Um, you know, the novel seems really, you know, steeped in standard <laughs> Um And so I wondered, could you talk a little bit about the way in which, say, Arlington <laughs> informed your, your, your sense of place and how that shaped the story, or is it shaped? Yeah, I think it definitely had an influence. I, I, I picked the town uh, Vandergriff. I, it was originally Arlington in the early drafts, but considering the way that... Um, some high school teachers, for example, behave in the book. I didn't want to, because nobody's based on <laughs> nobody's based on anybody real. So I didn't want my old teachers knocking down my door to tar and feather me. Um, so I renamed it, but I kept it close enough that you know everybody in this room would get the joke, um, which has been very gratifying. Um, but I, the the reason I picked the that setting is because I you know I lived here from the time I was three until I was thirty one. You know it was the only place in the world I really felt like I could write about with any sort of authority. So I, I figured for my first novel, I kind of needed to lean into that, you know, rather than like setting it, I don't know, like in France in the 1920s or something, um, about which I know nothing, you know. Um, it was, it, and honestly, you know, um, without giving too much away, there's also this weird uh, dynamic of the suburbs and the urban that kind of pops up in the book. And I think a lot of that is my own subconscious fears because growing up in Arlington, even though I was very close to both Dallas and Fort Worth, I was terrified of both of them. Uh, they seemed so big and scary. Uh, I was kind of a late bloomer, so I was very frightened to venture onto the highway or to go to the big city. I was convinced that like, 
I was going to blow a tire and get mugged or something. I don't know. It was, it was not rational, but I think that, that, that sense of place of sort of um, not necessarily a safe, but maybe a comfortable place uh, right on the edge of this sort of urban nightmare scape is definitely something that uh, helped shape the story for me. And I saw another hand. Yeah. My question was similar to the first, but I was also thinking about the Lovecraft elements. Is that part of how it connects to like Arlington as like an outskirt between mass populations in Dallas and Fort Worth? That's a good question. Um, so, you know, one thing about H.P. Lovecraft, who the book kind of owes a debt to, um, is that all of his work is sort of set in, well, most of his work is set in New England, which actually has sort of a, a history to it. You know, it, it's, you know, one of the first settled parts of the United States. And, um, you know, Arlington has been around for a while, but in a lot of ways it, it, it feels relatively new. You know, when I got here in the 80s, like most of Cooper Street was not what it is now. The Park Mall wasn't there, for example. Um, so sort of seeing it kind of grow up, I think also sort of informed like, I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily an answer to Lovecraft, but I think that, that that sense of being in a place that doesn't necessarily have that same level of history and sort of the more haunting aspects to somebody who's afraid of any place that's different, uh, you know, and the, the urban landscape sort of taking the shape of that, I guess. Does that, does that make sense? I feel like I'm kind of talking in circles here. Okay, good, good. Uh, yeah. Uh, what were the early steps towards publication like? I know you probably got a lot of writers here, and I don't personally know where to start. <laughs> right, right. No, it's, um, you know, it's a little different for everybody. Um, for me, I, you know, I was lucky enough to go to a graduate program, the Iowa Writers Workshop, which Laura mentioned. Um, and one of the nice things about that program is that agents and editors come from New York to visit the program, so we get to meet with them like one-on-one -on -one and, and, and show them our work. And you know, some people actually sign their book deals while they're still students. Um, and excuse me, I, I happened to meet with an editor um, who wasn't that interested in the book. I was actually having some trouble getting uh, the, public, the publishing world interested, uh, you know, in my book about monsters and family, uh, you know, at a program that's kind of famed for its uh, literary realism, you know. Uh, so I, I think a lot of agents and editors were like, I don't know what to do with this. And I don't know that this editor necessarily knew what to do with it either, but she interrupted me in the middle of, you know, my, my pitch. I was wearing this T-shirt that was just covered in superheroes, and she was like, you should get in touch with Kent Wolf at the Friedrich Agency because he would wear a t-shirt like that. And I was like, okay, thank you for your time. You know? <laughs> and I walked down the hall, pulled my laptop out of my bag, found his email address, and sent him an email you know, with a query about the book. And he wrote me back like within 20 minutes asking to see it. And then two weeks later, we were in business. Uh, and we spent about... So I signed with Kent as my agent in the late spring of 2016, and we spent about a year and change uh, finishing and revising the book before we sent it out to editors. And I don't know if all agents are that hands-on, but Kent definitely was. Uh, so he did a lot of pre-editing, so much so that what's published isn't all that different from what uh, we went we went out to sell with. You know, it was it was really just um, a lot of small edits. So. Uh, when we went out again, like I think even Kent was a little bit like I don't know what the market for this looks like and I remember talking to my wife Becca uh, Right before we you know, we're, we're gonna start sending it to editors in New York and saying like this thing There's no way this thing's gonna sell, you know, it's it's not enough of a horror novel for horror fans It's not literary enough for literary fans like it's just too weird. It's too in between but um, you know, I, I think I was lucky to be part of, you know, horror's kind of having a moment right now. You know, a couple of years ago, a horror film won the Oscar for best screenplay. Stranger Things is one of the biggest shows on TV, you know. Um, and we actually sent the book out, and this was deliberate, the same weekend that Stranger Things season two dropped on Netflix. So, and actually the editor I signed with brought that up in our first conversation. He was reading my book and watching Stranger Things at the same time, so. I sometimes wonder if he gets the two confused, but that's fine. I got paid. The book's out there. We're good. Um, but um, I was very lucky because what happened was we started getting responses right away. Sometimes when you send a book, it's out to market for a while. But um, 
we were getting editors reading it overnight, which is always a very good sign. Um, and it's not always a sign that something's gonna sell, but it's a good early indicator. So I got to talk to, I think I did like maybe six or seven phone calls with different editors, and uh, I was lucky enough not only to get to have those calls, because those calls are kind of like first dates where you and the editor are trying to feel each other out, and they kind of tell you what their vision for the book is, so like whether, what they might change, how they would want to position it in the market, all of that stuff, what they like about it, what they think needs work. And um, I was very lucky that I, I, I got to actually pick from several because based on those calls, not all of them made offers, but it, several of them did. And so we actually got to take the book to auction, which was a lot of fun, and I got to pick the editor that I wanted, uh, which was Tim O'Connell at uh, Pantheon, which is part of Knopf, which is part of Penguin Random House, which is all of publishing is really just one big publishing house. <laughs> they just put different names on it, I think. I still don't quite understand it all. Um, that's why I was an English major. Um, but, um, but yeah, so I, uh, Tim and I had had a connection right away. Like he really seemed to get what I was going for. And um, that was, you know, so once the book, the, we sold it in the fall of 2017 and then spent the next year in edits. And most of the edits were really about figuring out uh, you know, some tonal stuff, some, of, uh, some exposition, like how much world building to put in, how much to leave mysterious, which goes actually back to your question about you know, with the monster, how much to show and how much to leave hidden. Um, and we actually did end up pulling out a lot of that stuff and, and, and you know, trying to make sure that the horror and family elements were in balance, but it was really all a question of degrees, and, but it took a year, you know, and I don't know if that's common or not. Maybe I was really hard to work with. I hope that's not the case, but I, I don't really know because I have nothing to compare it to. Um, and then uh, they spent most of this year getting ready to launch the book. So they, they have to launch it in-house first, which means they take it to the board of directors with the finished manuscript, and they decide on a, a release date, um, you know, and then they start working on, like, the cover art and... Um, you know, they start trying to, uh, they start publishing ARCs, advanced readers copies, and getting those out to booksellers uh, at, at bookstores, trying to build buzz and critics and bloggers and things like that. So it, that, it, so that's like a whole nother year that's just kind of coming to a close now. This is my last leg of publicity for now. Hopefully I'll get to do some more for the paperback next year. Um, but yeah, it's, so it's a very long process. And one thing I would say is that um, I had another book and another agent and all of that fell apart So, bef while I was at Iowa, actually. So this is actually my second go through with the publishing world. So I would also say to any, you know, I know there are a lot of writers in the room. So um, the main thing would be to expect some setbacks, but just keep plugging away and, you know, you'll find the right person for your work, I think, or you should find the right person for your work. Uh, yeah. Um, my question actually builds off really well um, from that one. Um, you talked about uh, your experiences at the Iowa Workshop as a, more of a drama writer and it's more of a literary play, so you talked about how it's kind of a weird fit because it's a blending between the two worlds. I wanted to ask, do you think the distinction between genre and literary is maybe eroding away or maybe people are coming around more to genre now? Like, it, like you, told, you, you spoke that uh, horror is having its moment right now, but in general, do you think people are becoming more amenable to stories like these? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, when I first started noticing it was almost 20 years ago. It was when Michael Shaban, you know, won the, the Pulitzer for um, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay back in like 2001, 2002. And then he started editing these McSweeney's anthologies where he would get all these big name writers, uh, some literary, some, you know, pop fiction, and they would all contribute like plot driven short stories to these anthologies that were sort of a call back to like the old pulp magazines and stuff. And I think writers like him or Jonathan Latham, uh, you know, or Karen Russell, uh, you know, Amy Bender, like it's been going on for a while, uh, this, this sort of blurring of the lines between, you know, what's genre and what's literary and, um, you know, and I think that's as a, a, a bunch of writers who grew up reading genre are sort of becoming the instructors. So the, the director of the workshop had changed from, you know, most of the writers you know of who came out of Iowa were under, uh, I think Frank Conroy was the name of the, the director. But now Lance Samantha Chang is the head of the workshop and she's a lot more open to like, play, you know, playing with literary tropes uh, or genre tropes or form, uh, you know, 
And that, that makes a big difference is I think you've, you've got a lot of those people who grew up, you know, loving Stephen King who are now book critics, who are now professors, who are, you know, who are the ones writing the novels. And I think that's a generational shift, you know, who knows what it looks like in another 20 years. But right now it's like, I feel like I wasn't, you know, breaking through. I'm just kind of building on, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants right now. So, but yeah, I definitely feel like that's a, that's a thing. And I'm very lucky to have got to come along when I did. Um, sorry, I feel like I've been facing this side of the room a lot. Uh, have I been ignoring anybody over here? Are we? Yeah. What's the next project? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure yet. I've got two books that I'm sort of working on at the same time right now, and I'm kind of uh, waiting on my agent to give me the go ahead on one or the other. Um, I, uh, with, with the next one, I kind of want my agent in on the ground floor because his notes and his instincts have been so good on cosmology. So I kind of just want to get his feel because he knows the market so much better than I do. Like, is this an easy sell? What would be the big stumbling block ahead of time? So I've got two different things um, that, that he's looking at right now. So hopefully we'll, um, We'll decide on that, but they're both sort of in the same, not the same world, but the same vibe. You know, they're 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 the the genre. I'm I'm calling it a suburban gothic. So um, one leans a little more fantasy, and the other's like a, a more traditional ghost story. So um, I'm hoping one of those will be the next one, and I'll have more to talk about sooner rather than later. This one I started in the fall of 2014, so. I'm really hoping it doesn't take another five years to get the next book, but you know, it takes as long as it takes. Um, I saw another hand over here. Yeah. Can you speak on some of the advantages and disadvantages of having a, a six-year-old narrator? Or are you going to continue to use six-year-old? <laughs> um, well, I will say that, um, so the, the point of telling in the book is pretty far from Noah at six. So the, the, the excerpt that I read, there is one section of the book that takes place when Noah is six. And I, I think it would have been really hard to write without some psychic distance, to use a phrase Laura was talking about in class yesterday. Um, I think having the, if I was trying to write a child the way a child thinks, I think that that, for me at least, it would have been very difficult to pull off without sounding very uh, precious or cute. Uh, so for me, the solution was having somebody who's closer to 40 narrating things that happen to him whenever he's six, um, rather than somebody who's seven talking about what happened when he was six. You know, that, so moving the point of telling pretty far out, I think, gave me a lot of leeway to both interpret what was happening and also foreshadow uh, while you know still being direct in terms of uh, reporting what Noah is thinking and feeling. Um, and honestly, I don't know. I feel like I'm not quite done with the coming of age story, so I wouldn't rule it out. But I I don't want that to necessarily be my thing. I don't want people to be like, oh yeah, that's the six year old guy, you know, <laughs> whenever, whenever they see me, uh, you know, in a book review or something. Um, but I, I wouldn't rule it out. Yeah. So because. Um, that's a really good question. So I don't really know since I've only got the one book, right? That's, I'm trying to figure that out in real time. You were listening to me try to figure that out right, right in front of you. But um, for me, I think, you know, and that's, that's actually been a problem getting the next thing started because I, even while I was in edits on this book, I was trying to get the next book started, you know, between drafts. Um, and I was having trouble because everything felt too much like this. Um, I think part of it is you have to let go and realize that deep down you're going to be writing about the same themes over and over again. It's just, uh, you know, maybe how you feel about them at 35 is different than how you felt about them at 25 or 45 or whatever, you know, uh, and hope that your thinking continues to evolve so you have new things to say on those subjects. But also realizing, and this is something I'm really struggling with right now, that you don't really get to decide how the world perceives you and your work, so if they decide to pigeonhole you, there's not a whole lot you can do about that except just keep doing what you're doing. And kind of, you, you, at a certain point, you just have to do what you're gonna do, do it as well as you can, and 
let the world figure out what to do with it, you know? Uh, and that's been really hard for me to sort of let go of. That's why I have stopped checking Goodreads, for example, or <laughs> my Amazon page or whatever. Um, because honestly, like, that's not for me. That's for other readers, you know? That, and, and what people say about it, you know, I have no control over. Like, that's, it's theirs now, you know? Um, so I think it, it's something worth considering as you're working, but also realizing you have no real power over one, the things that inspire you, and two, what the audience does with your work once it's out there um, can be very freeing. It's been very freeing for me recently to kind of be able to put some of that away and just get excited about telling a story again. Does, does that kind of, okay, good. Yes, ma'am. I wonder if you could talk about your process as a writer, because you mentioned that for a year you worked very closely with your agent, and could you talk about So I think that, uh, you know, I think Mary Oliver, I forget the name of the book, but she has this wonderful book about writing poetry. It's very short. Um, it might be like On Becoming a Poet or something. It's some very basic sounding title, but she talks about how basically you have to make a daily appointment with the page, uh, and some days the muse is going to come and, you know, sprinkle her, his or her fairy dust on you and, you know, give you the, the magic words, and some days... The muse isn't going to show up, but you have to be there every day. And that was really true for me because I actually wrote this book through some of the worst writer's block I've ever had in my life. Um, you know, it, in large part, it was not exhilarating. Like the, the first 30, 40 pages were very exhilarating because I felt like, okay, I found my project. I've got a story to tell here. And then the next, you know, two years were really tough, but... I would, you know, I kept showing up every day and sitting down and my process is not one I would recommend, but this is what works for me. Uh, I write by hand. I, I do it for two hours a day. I prefer to do it in the morning, which was one nice thing about grad school was I kind of got to make my own schedule a little bit. Um, now I have to do it in the evening, but I like to use yellow legal pads and roller ball pins. Uh, I can type faster than I can think and start reaching for cliches and stuff. So. Uh, being left-handed and having to push a pin across this, a page, you know, there's something masochistic about it, but it also slows me down, uh, so I have to think about every single word that I use before I put it down on paper. And I also feel free to make mistakes in a way I don't when I'm typing because it all looks so clean and professional whenever it's in Microsoft Word versus, you know, my terrible handwriting on a yellow legal pad. Who cares if it's ugly or it's bad, you know, because it's just handwriting as opposed to typing and for some reason my brain makes that distinction so that's that's how I kind of struggle through a first draft is I just show up every day and I know some days that everything I've written is probably no good or is going to get cut or something because I don't outline so I'm kind of like stumbling from one moment to the next trying to kind of figure it out um, you know flying by the seat of my pants um, and uh, so yeah uh, once I finish the first draft that way, then I type it up. And so I'm getting a second draft as I'm, I'm uh, transcribing my work. And, um, and then, you know, sometimes if it's not ready, then I'll print it out and start the whole thing over again and just keep the written manuscript and rewrite it by hand over and over again. Um, so, yeah, yeah, does that, does that, <laughs> you know, and you just got to expect, like, a lot of it's going to kind of fall apart and, you know, just you're going to have setbacks and you just... I, I can't tell you how many days I, you know, would talk to my wife in the evening and be like, the wheels are about to fall off this thing, you know. Uh, and luckily it never did, but that's, you got to keep showing up even whenever it feels like it's going wrong and hope and trust the process to get you through it, I guess, or that's what worked for me. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, like, I kind of got the vibe of, like, E.T. or something like that. So, like, what's your, like, inspiration for the whole book and all that? I mean, E.T. is actually a big part of the inspiration for the book. I mean, the cover of the book is even kind of like the poster for E.T., right, which has the two fingers touching, except it's two I didn't give them that note. I'm very happy they picked up on it. Um, 
I, I, you know, it was, um, so I, I kind of wanted to play with the, with the, you know, the Amblin, you know, 80s Steven Spielberg tropes, especially in the section set in the 80s. Uh, I'd say H.P. Lovecraft's fiction and Stephen King, um, you know, all the stuff I grew up loving reading as a, as a young person uh, were really the big inspirations for the book. Plus, you know, kind of wanting to work out some of my own personal demons, but, you know, with actual demons as well, you know, so sort of uh, playing in that space between literary and genre uh, really uh, energized me as a storyteller with this project. Thank you, Thank you guys for coming. Thank you.